Greetings from the streets of Anderson. Um, Old missions of the upstate, where for the last six weeks or so we've been uh, a warming center for the county, um, providing a place for people to sleep. And when it's cold, like last night, we had 25 people uh, staying with us last night. I start out that way just because I want you to know how much um, I've learned about being around um, a lot of people that, that, that desire um, support and kindness and love. And it's a joy to do that. It's, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a privilege. So I'm hanging around you guys all the time. And you guys have taught me that well. Um, and it's cool to be able to do that. But here's the thing I tell people all the time. And I want you to hear this if you fall asleep. Not Joseph. Joseph is sound asleep. If you fall asleep, I want you to hear this. And I say this all the time, but I'm going to do it again. You are made in the image of God. First chapter of the Bible, open up the Bible, the very first page. You are made in the image of God. Each and every one of you. Each and every one of you. you we are all brothers and sisters. Everyone, regardless of what car we drove or if we walked up here. If we had a bike that was falling apart, or if we had, you know, dropped off by a chauffeur. That hadn't happened to me yet, but it's not my desire to be honest with you. But it's we are each made in the image of God, each and every one of us. Now, do you believe in God? Amen. You believe in God. God created everything that we see. And in one moment, God created you in your mother's womb, unseen, unknown, except to him. And Psalm 139 tells us he created this beautiful thing and that became you. And so the, the topic or the title of the sermon today is to be kind. And so when we start with this in mind, I hope it makes sense that we're related. That you're my brother. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're related to each other. We should be kind to one another, right? Yes. Yeah. Anybody believe that? Yes. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> be kind. Now what does that look like? Well, there's a challenge. When we are kind, when we act as the church, the big C church, you know what I'm saying when I say the big C church? I'm not talking about United Methodist Church or Presbyterian or whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about the big C church. Yeah. We are God's plan A. You know what I mean by that? Plan A? There is no plan B. The church is his instrument for which we will change the world. The song I attempted to sing in true confession, I didn't know I was singing a song this morning until I got here. <laughs> <laughs> my wife was good enough to go grab my guitar. Uh, but we, they will know we're, we're Christians by our love. That's how they should know us. They should know us by that. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute in, in detail, I think. We'll see where God leads me on this. So let me start with the scripture that I picked to make sure we're, we're on the same page. And then I'm going to take you on a tour of scripture. And then I'm going to introduce you to some of my heroes. And we'll get into this. Believe it or not, sometime around 3 or 4 this afternoon. We'll go. Okay? You good for that, G? All right. I got the thumbs up from the drummer, so you can be here while you in Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Amen. 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 Well, this whole idea of being kind is not exactly new. 
you've heard a little bit about this. First, I'm going to give you what I call the red letter words. Guess, I, not like I made that up, don't get me wrong. Red letter Bible is one of the things I really like. And translation that I look at, the words of Jesus are written in red. And so I'm going to start with the words of Jesus here. Luke records this in chapter 6. He says, And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be paid in full. But love your enemies. You said something about that. Love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. Now, this is why the comparison is here, okay? You just heard that love your enemies, right? Then your reward will be great. The comparison is here for us to understand. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So loving your enemies, understand that the context of that is because God was kind enough when we were his enemies. You get that? He didn't have to do what he did. He did it for us because he was kind and compassionate. In Romans 2, we're going to read a lot about Paul today. In fact, all of these quotes I'm going to give you are letters from Paul, okay, after, after that. In Romans 2, God's kindness is intended to lead us to what? Somebody said it, repentance, right? God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. That's why he's doing this. In Romans 11, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell. But kindness to you provided, provided that you continue in his kindness. Imagine that. 1 Corinthians 13, you ever heard of that? Love is patient, love is Kind. Yeah, you've heard about that. Second Corinthians. As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love. In Galatians, this, I wrote a song about this. I almost did this song. I wrote a song for a vacation Bible school. 2004, was it? It was a long time ago, down in Florida. And it's this little blues song. I should have done it. <laughs> but it, but it, was, it was trying to teach the kids about what love is. Love is patient, you know, and we have this fruit of the Spirit. Everybody heard that, fruit of the Spirit? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And the last one is the one I always harp on. The last one is self-control. Uh, that's a hard one, right? Man, we deal with that all the time. And God, in Ephesians 2, God raised up with Christ, raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Expressed in his kindness to us, God's kindness to us. Wow, okay. In Colossians here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with kindness, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Put up with me. Put up with each other. Man, the world goes better when we apply these things, doesn't it? Second Timothy. This is Paul's teaching to his son, Timothy. Man, there's a whole story there I'd love to get into. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> do I need to say that again? Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And he, he talks to Titus. 
chapter 3, but with the kindness and love of God our Savior, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So that's a little bit of a treatise on where kindness shows up in the Bible. And I think that's super important for us to understand that we have to be kind. And there's some of my heroes I want to introduce you to. I want to introduce you to Mother Teresa. Anybody know who Mother Teresa is? One, two, three, four. Oh, oh there they go. Okay. Now they're called you out. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa that we know um, in her, most of her years, she spent tending to those that were dying on the streets in Calcutta. That she just wanted to let them die in dignity. Can you imagine that being your calling? Did you get that call? You got that email and said, okay, Gene, guess what? Now you're going to do for the rest of your life. You're going you're gonna to reach out to people that are dying and give them some place to die in dignity. And so Mother Teresa did that for years and years and years. And ultimately, from our perspective, not from her perspective, from from our perspective, ultimately, she ended up getting the Nobel Peace Prize for what she, for all her accomplishments. And I can assure you, that wasn't on her list of things to achieve. She wasn't after any kind of recognition. She was just trying to care for people the way that she thought God called her to care for them. And so she did, day after day after day. And, and it became this really big thing. But she got a chance to speak, and this is on this is on um, the, the I found this on, on YouTube somewhere. I can't remember where it was now. But she had this acceptance speech, and in that she had so many quotes in there that are so important. I love the uh, when she got the Nobel Peace Prize. She said she gave everybody a copy of the Prayer of Francis Assisi and had everybody read it. Uh, this is cool. So if I ever get a chance <laughs> to talk to a secular, a fully secular crowd, I'm going to pass these out and do this. So she had them all, and it was pretty funny because every once in a while, this is, this is a long time ago, so every once in a while the camera would pan, you know, it's the guys in the suits and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, but they all had to read the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. And here's what it says. Lord, make me a channel of your peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love. Where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where there is discord, I may bring harmony. Where there is error, I may bring truth. Where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there are shadows, I may bring light. That where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it's by forgetting self that one finds. It's by forgiving that one is forgiven. It's by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. And she had much to say to that crowd that was listening, and I know some of them were squirming in their sense because I can see them on the video. But she did that. Another one of my heroes, I promise I really am going to get back to the text. Another one of my heroes is Father Greg Warren. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries. And you know, thanks to my wife's persistence, I actually finally read the books so that I can understand a little bit about what he was about. And I've truly been blessed as a result of that. Um, but Father Greg, for 40 years now, has been working on gang um, uh, intervention in the streets of Los Angeles. Guys that are in gangs, that are doing horrendous things in gangs. And he brings them in with open arms and welcomes them and loves on them. And for those that want to participate, key phrase right here, those that want to participate, they, are, they, are, they come in and do an 18-month program not 18 days, not 18 weeks, 18 months. They go through a process where they can be transformed and reintegrated back into society. So, and the reason I give you that little background on that, 
40 years he's been doing this. I think in his latest book, there was something like he has presided over 240-some funerals because gang members have a tendency to shoot each other. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. It's not a pretty sight. And for those of us on the outside looking at it, we would say, this is, this is horrible. All of this is horrible. But listen to any of his speeches. Listen to Father Greg's speeches. And he's going to tell you this. Kindness is the only strength there is. And here's a quote. I want you to hear this. Only kinship. Kinship. What is kinship? Anybody know? Brothers and sisters, right? That's why I've been harping on this so much. Only kinship. Inching ourselves closer to creating a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. Soon we imagine with God the circle of compassion. Then we imagine no, no one standing outside of that circle. Moving ourselves closer to the margins so that the margins themselves will be erased. We stand there with those whose dignity has been denied. 25 guys slept with us last night. And I, I use that term generally. We have women there in their 60s, women in their 30s. We have guys in their 60s older than me and much younger than me. We stand there with those whose dignity has been denied. We locate ourselves with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. At the edges, we join the easily despised and the readily left out. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And if you've ever worked with addiction, guys, you know what I'm talking about. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. If we don't stand there, how is it going to stop? If we don't stand there, how is it going to stop? It's not. We have to be willing to step into that space. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. We situate ourselves right next to the disposable so that the day will come when we will stop throwing people away. We stand, we situate ourselves right next to the disposable. We make it. We intentionally get there. We situate ourselves right next to the, the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. These are my heroes that are on earth. Father Greg is still walking around. Mother Teresa died some years ago. But I hope that this will help us frame this whole narrative to be kind. We have so much to learn about our Christian life. We have this short little book called Ephesians. Now, you guys have been to, a lot of you have been to the Bible study that I leave either here or at, at uh, Hope Missions or whatever. But the thing I will tell you is so many times, you can't just read a verse. It doesn't make any sense to just read a verse or two. You need to read the whole thing. So in this case, this is a, this is a book we call Ephesians. But it's really a letter that's written to somebody. So when's the last time you got a letter from somebody? And you flip to the third page and read a sentence. <laughs> no, that doesn't make any sense at all. Read the whole thing, okay? Here's the deal. I'm not a real fast reader. My wife, very fast reader. I'm not a real fast reader. It takes 10 minutes to read the entire book, okay? In that 10 minutes, you're going to allow yourself to be transformed. And so the reason I read all of that scripture before, and I'm going to read, we're going to talk about it, we're going to dive into it a little bit here. Um, is that it's so important to surround yourself with that. You know, if you're feeling down, feeling, you know, miserable or whatever, just read the scripture. Just read it. And I promise if, you, if you're listening, if your heart is not as hard as this, right? If you're listening to that, it's going to minister to you. And that's what it, I mean, I know it's what it does for me. And I guarantee you that if you do that with, a, with an open heart, you're going to be ministered to. You're going to see that. So read that whole book. An entire 10 minutes. And, and here's what commentators told me here in reading this. The understanding of the gospel in Ephesians challenges and redefines the superficial understanding of the gospel prevalent in our day. The superficial understanding of the gospel. 
The gospel is not meant to be this, you know, get a badge and wear it thing. This gospel requires people to act. This faith works. Believers have a responsibility to make choices and change the pattern of their lives. An easy believism or passive faith cannot survive under the penetrating message of this letter. So what that tells me is that if I read 10 minutes, if I devoted 10 minutes each day, let's just do it for a week. Anybody up for that homework? I, someone will raise their hand. And, I, and somebody will actually do this. So for one week, read Ephesians. And, and watch what it says to you. Watch how it talks to you, okay? We're going to get into it. It's not an easy faith that we have. It's simple. It's really simple. You know, anybody had that? You know, say a prayer. It's really simple, right? And then it's all changed, right? No, it's not. It might be a simple concept, but it's hard work. It's hard work, and I'm not going to make it easy on you. I'm going to tell you, you have to love people who are addicted, who are, are drunk, who are high. I'm going to tell you, you have to love them. People that are hungry, people that come in that need clothes, people that smell. I'm going to tell you, you have to care about that. And you have to care about people that don't smell odor-wise, but yet their lives stink. And you have to care about them all. Why? Because we are here to stand beside that person. We are here to be those people. Man. So, <laughs> be kind. Easy, right? So, it's kind of a subjective word though, right? I wonder, is Julie, is, is Julie twice as kind as Bill? Hmm. Now, I was picking on Corey because Kelvin wasn't here, but I, was, I wrote this down. Anyway. Was Kelvin half as kind today as he was yesterday? I don't know. What does that mean? Everyone knows Pastor Curtis kind. He's not here, so we can talk about it. <laughs> but how kind is he? How do you measure that? Is he like really kind? I mean, how, how does that work? What I know is that kindness doesn't have an income bracket. It doesn't matter what kind of income you have. It doesn't cost anything to be kind. I think there's a song about that, right? It doesn't cost anything to be kind. I can remember, gosh, today's Sunday. A couple days ago, Friday, one of our guys, Mike, wanted the leaf blower because there's too much stuff on our courtyard. So he took the leaf blower out there and started blowing leaves. And he came back in a couple minutes later. The battery had died, so I gave him another battery. A few more minutes later, the battery died too. So he went through three batteries to blow off the leaves. I didn't ask him to do that. But he wanted to express his kindness, his love, his appreciation for what we were doing. And so he did that. <laughs> I have a guy here. I love this story. I'm not going to mention names, but one of, our, one of the guys that's staying with us getting another guy to go to church last Sunday. Now, this was really hilarious. If you remember last Sunday, right about the time that you would have to walk to church, it was raining. And it was just that much cold. It was just like, eh, man, I think I'll just sit here and do nothing. Well, that was person B. <laughs> and person A was like, come on, man, it's time to go to church. <laughs> and he was like, man, I'm just going to chill here today. Get your coat on. You got a coat. Let's go. And he drug him off to church. And he walked him down the street to Capstone. That was a beautiful thing. Another example, um, Trevor came to, to me. He's like, yesterday he came up to him. He said, did you guys clean the bathrooms? I'm like, no, man, I haven't had time to clean the bathrooms. You know, we've been doing all this stuff. He goes, no, man, I, you didn't clean the bathroom. No, I didn't clean the bathrooms. They were as clean as I've ever seen them. Why was that? Well, some of our guys got some stuff and they went and cleaned the bathrooms. Now, that's a beautiful story. And that's all built on the kindness. What we try to do, you know, not only at Old Missions, we do it here at South Main too. We're trying to instill that love. And we care so much about people that they would want to be able to do that sort of thing. It's contagious. I hope it is contagious, Don. I really do. I really do. It's, it's an active faith that we live out in moments of passion and love for each other in ways that don't often make sense. Why serve lunch to someone wandering off the streets? 
Why provide a place for someone who's probably drunk or high to sleep on a warm cot? Why? Because it's the kind and loving thing to do. Are they just taking advantage of us? Maybe. But where would they sleep if we weren't there? Think about this. If we can't be kind to those who need it most, how can we be kind to one another? If we can't be kind to those who need it most, how can we be kind to one another? Just yesterday, someone came into our space as we were wrapping up for breakfast. 23-year-old I never met before. He was cold, confused. He hadn't slept the night before. He was starving. And we put some food together for him. We had a warm place for him to hang out for a bit. Gave him direction for the next step and the assurance that we'd be around later. And I mentioned Trevor, and he would be really mad if I called him out by name. But Trevor truly engaged with this guy and told man, we love you, we care about you. We want you to be okay. We want you to be okay. If someone hadn't been there, he would have had no chance to see the body of Christ in action. Zero. It's one of my wife's favorite numbers. Because she's a math witness. But one of her favorite numbers is zero. If we don't stand in that gap, folks, there's a zero percent chance, a zero percent chance that someone will get to see Christ in action. So you got to stand up in that gap, every one of us, every one of us. I'm not pointing at you. I'm saying every one of us has to stand in that gap. We have to do that. Now, what's encouraging is that there are many that do that. I want you to know that you're not alone. There are many that enthusiastically embrace the idea of providing basic needs for people every day of the week, formal and informal, whether it's a program where they just see something and do it. This is how the body of Christ was meant to function. We were, we were talked to, Paul talks about being unity in all this. In, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, I know it's chapters, and it's just this, this part of the letter talks about unity and how we all should be unified. When we work together in unity, each doing our own part, Christ is honored, Christ is served. The emphasis is not how great we are, rather, it's how great our God is. And listen to this quote. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That one caught me about two weeks ago. I was reading. And, and I remembered it where it said Christ died for us. You remember that? At just the right time. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us. But that's not what it says. <laughs> it is us. But what it says is for the ungodly. For those that were far from him. Those that were his enemy. Those that should have been cast out. But God cares so much, so much, that he would die for the, he would send Christ to die for the ungodly. And if Christ were willing to die for the ungodly, that is you and me. Don't you think we would do well to serve others? The whole point, you know, let me wrap up the entire Old Testament for you real quick, okay? It'll only take me about now. Listen, when God called his people, way back in Deuteronomy, way back in Deuteronomy, oh wait, let's do it right. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people. He chose them. He chose the Israelites to be a separate people, to look different than everybody else. You remember that? Does that make sense? He chose them to be separate from all the other people, all the other countries and all that stuff. He set aside people so that they would be different, so that they would look different. He gave them a set of rules that looked different. These things we call the Ten Commandments, right? They wanted to be different. And what did they want? What did the people end up wanting? Huh? Somebody said king. king. All this. They, what did the people want? People wanted to look like everybody else. Well, that's not that's not God's plan. So what I'm telling you is that we are supposed to look different. 
We're supposed to act different. It should be weird what we do. It shouldn't make sense when we're kind of people that don't deserve to be kind. We should be those kind of people. And the whole book of Ephesians seeks to shape believers by reminding them how wonderful God's work in Christ is, how significant their unity in Christ is, and what living for Christ looks like. It's a letter of definition and encouragement. Paul sought to ground, shape, and challenge his readers so that they might live their faith. This is not a faith to put up on a shelf. It's not an achievement to attain. This is not something where you get a badge. This is something we have to live out. We have to live out those things. Okay. Now we can start. <laughs> Now we can start. I'm probably out of time. Um, man, this is just so good. I hope you guys really will read Ephesians as a letter written to you, as a letter written to the church. Um, I'm going to read this because I, I just absolutely have to. It will take about three minutes, so bear with me. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. In case you're wondering, I'm in chapter 4 of Ephesians here, verse 17 through 19. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to the sensual, to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. You wonder about our culture all wrapped up in pornography, all wrapped up in this nudity, all wrapped up in all kinds of things that distract them from loving God the way that they're supposed to. Guess what? It's written right there in your Bible. It's right there for you in case you're wondering. It's, it is so contemporary. We need to read this. In verse 20, that however, that however is not the way you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance, to, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. That is not what we taught you. That is not what we've been taught. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. What did we say about your former way of life? To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. We're all in this together. We're all brothers and sisters. In your anger, do not sin. Didn't say don't be angry. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal. And then, side note, it's kind of funny. One of the guys, as they 